Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out tonight, or this evening, rather, to the uh, when Android Mac Cloud presentation. My name is Sandeep Hinoat. I'm a senior developer evangelist for uh, Salesforce.com. can be found lurking at uh, CloudySan on Twitter for those who are uh, so inclined. Uh, again, wanted to thank you all for uh, coming out this evening. I know there's a, there's a Giants game tonight, so I'm, uh, I'm glad you guys chose, uh, chose me over that. Maybe you just didn't get tickets for that. Whatever, I'll take it. Doesn't matter as long as you're all here. So thanks for coming out. Also, irony alert, uh, I just realized I have JavaScript books down there propping up my Android presentation. So uh, that just shows you the right place of JavaScript in the world, at the bottom of the heap. All right, no more JavaScript jokes. All right, promise. Uh, so before I get started, this is our standard legalese disclaimer. I'm required to show at all public presentations keeps the lawyers up in HQ happy, and uh, if there's one thing I've learned in life, it's you want to keep American lawyers happy, right? So standard legal disclaimer, make any purchasing decisions of our stock on publicly available information, not on any forward-looking statements I might make today. So uh, on to the uh, topic at hand, when Android met cloud. So what I'm going to talk about today is basically is Android developers, why, uh, you know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence and, and and assume that you don't know what cloud is. Everybody has heard of, of the term cloud, cloud computing, SaaS, IAS. There are many, many acronyms flying around. But what I want to do today is really spend time on, on trying to make the case of why as Android developers, we all should care about the cloud. What is it in it for me as an Android developer? Why should I care about the cloud? What are some of the advantages that I can get from the cloud? And specifically, I'm going to focus my attention mostly on enterprise Android apps, right? Um, so we all know the consumer world, uh, mobile world, right? There are hundreds and thousands of apps that are focused on the consumer market. But I want to really focus on the enterprise market. I'm, and actually, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, why it's even worth talking about enterprise mobile apps. Because people ask me all the time, is really there's something going on in the enterprise mobile world? There is actually a lot going on. So I want to focus today's talk really on how enterprise mobile applications can leverage the power of the cloud to really build their applications with quicker time to market, higher ROI, and all the other good stuff. Before I get started, I mean, I, I already saw uh, somebody snicker. So obviously, some, some of you got the reference to the uh, infamous scene from that movie, from that picture. But uh, no worries. Every, nothing about this presentation will be fake, unlike, unlike that scene. All right. Um, so. Let's start with, uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to focus really on enterprise uh, Android apps in particular, right? So, you know, obviously the first question I want to address is why, why are we talking about enterprise and not what everybody in the world seems to consider or think about when they think of mobile apps, which is true for Android and iOS and pretty much any other platform. Well, there is no other platform in the world these days, is it? It's just Android and iOS. Uh, so bottom line, everybody when they think of mobile apps, Android or otherwise, thinks of consumer apps, right? We all know them. We, you know, there are literally hundreds and thousands of them on the App Store, Apple App Store, Android App Store. We all know what consumer apps is. You know, they're, they're all the, the gaming apps and, and, and non-trivial ones as well, obviously. But what's interesting is how the, uh, the, the, the revolution, really, the mobile revolution that kind of started in the consumer world is sort of bleeding into the enterprise world, right? And different analysts have given, given different terms to this trend. You know, some, you might have heard the term consumerization of IT. Uh, some other analysts have called, you know, call it by different names. But it, it all refers to the same phenomena, which is namely, we can't imagine living our lives, our personal lives, without our phones or our tablets or whatever, uh, whatever device of choice you have, right? Anybody who's, on, uh, who's taken a munibus knows that. We're, we're glued to our, our, our mobile phones in our personal lives, right? But more and more in the enterprise IT world, the CIOs and the IT managers are being asked by their users, by their employees, is, hey, I'm used to getting my data anywhere I want, whenever I want on my mobile device. How come I can't access my enterprise data from my mobile device, right? Is what's, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the consumer uh, world has taught us, as I said, to expect ubiquity of data and access anywhere we are on any device. Uh, we are, you know, tablet, mobile, or obviously desktop. And why can't that work in the enterprise world, right? And so more and more of the enterprise uh, uh, decision makers, the IT decision makers, are having to address that question and try and address how do I make my enterprise data available to my employees or customers or partners, whatever your use case may be, but still address all the requirements 
that typically enterprise mobile apps have, have some special requirements that may or may not always apply to consumer apps, right? We probably all know them. You know, security is probably number one. Enterprise mobile apps, that's probably the one boogaboo that, that people come up with as, a, as an excuse of why your enterprise data isn't mobilized. Oh, security. Well, all right. So security is important. Scalability is important. Reliability is important, right? All of these things are super, super critical for enterprise mobile apps. And maybe not so much for consumer apps, right? But more and more of people are trying to answer that question is how do I enable access to my enterprise data while still meeting all these enterprise level requirements uh, for it? And there are many statistics out there that back up that whole consumerization of IT trend, the BYOD trend, somebody, some people have called bring your own device to work uh, trend. And there's you know, this, uh, this uh, survey that we did recently kind of backs it up. 46% of IT uh, managers surveyed today say they allow your BYOD. Basically, you bring your own iOS or Android device, and you can access your enterprise data from it, right? Whatever. Some, some selected enterprise apps you can access on those devices. But fully 90% of, of CIOs at least claim that they will support that by, uh, in the next two years. And again, another metric from Gartner, which again backs up the same point, mobile is literally number one and number two on the, list, on, the, on the list of things that CIOs and IT managers care about the most this year. This is not next year. This is not in the near future. It is today. The enterprise world, the mobile, the mobile question is looming large over the enterprise world. So in a nutshell, that is why you as an Android developer should care about enterprise mobile apps. Because frankly, that's where the money is. That's where the market is, right? So that's why, uh, you know, that's why I want to focus really this, this talk and today's evening uh, discussion on enterprise mobile apps and how they can specifically use cloud computing. Speaking of cloud computing, um, I promise not to insult your intelligence by defining, trying to explain what cloud computing is. Uh, but I did want to do a quick level set of what I would consider the three flavors of cloud computing, right? There is no right or wrong answer here. There's, I'm not meaning to imply one form is better than the other or different. They're all just different. They're for different use cases, right? And I'll try, you know, sort of contrast them. But bottom line, you have your, you know, at the bottom sort of of the stack, you have what's called infrastructure as a service, right? IAS. Probably heard that term a lot. And those are the vendors from anywhere from your uh, friendly neighborhood uh, online bookseller to there are many other IAS vendors in the world, of course. Uh, but of course, Amazon is, is the most famous example. And these vendors basically provide virtualized uh, uh, hardware, servers, and other other piece of database, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the physical hardware that you need is provided to you completely virtualized over the internet on uh, as I need, consume as much as you need basis, right? Like your utility bill. You pay as much as you want on a monthly basis, and if you want to ever shut it down, you just shut it down. As simple as that. It's awesome. IS is just it's great. But on top of that, there's another flavor of cloud computing called PaaS, platform as a service, right? And these are the vendors and, and the platform that I'm going to actually talk about more, the force.com platform that Salesforce provides, is an example of FAST. However, that's not by no means the only one. There are many, many others. There is Microsoft Azure. There is Google App Engine, just to name you know, one of the two more better known uh, um, vendors that provide PaaS. Uh, actually, you know, StackMob, uh, our, our host today, is, would be an example of a PaaS uh, pass, uh, provider that provides a, uh, an abstraction layer over just the hardware. So in other words, unlike IAS providers, PaaS providers provide you some additional application services, for example, a managed software stack on top of just virtualized CPU or virtualized computing power. They provide an additional level of abstraction so that you are that, that much more productive, right? And then, of course, at the top are the SaaS, the software as a service applications. Again, Salesforce, the CRM, we're probably best known for our CRM application all delivered over the internet on a, a need to know, you know, need, consume as much, as much as you want, monthly subscription basis. There are so many other examples, especially of enterprise apps that are built and delivered through the SaaS model. Concur for expenses, I, I use that myself. NetSuite, you can run your entire ERP in the cloud uh, with the uh, SaaS model, right? So those are you know, just very basic definition of the three flavors of cloud computing. Now for Android developers specifically, for, you know, for the topic of to, uh, you know, for, for, for the purposes of today's discussion, SaaS doesn't really play a picture. We, you know, those are ready-made applications. You can access them from any device, any form factor. They're not that relevant. We're really going to focus more on the PaaS uh, providers, really, because I'm going to try and make the case of why PaaS, using a PaaS uh, backend for your mobile app, makes a lot of sense, right? And, and it's 
it's, it's better to do versus using just a simple IAS cloud provider as your backend. So I'm going to try and make that case. All right, so with that sort of basic, or what, what's cloud computing? Those are the basic three uh, sort of flavors, if you will, of cloud computing. So to the, to the core question for today, is as mobile, as mobile developers, Android or iOS, whatever mobile development or HTML5, whatever you do, as mobile developers, why should we care about cloud? And it's really, it's very simple, just one word, time to market. Is cloud really enables you to focus on the one thing that you should ever actually focus on as a mobile developer, which is your mobile app, which is the client, which is the user experience that your users get from your mobile app, right? Cloud takes care of the, all the stuff that needs to happen on the back end, right? We all know any mobile app, especially an enterprise mobile app, is, needs some data. It needs to source its data from somewhere, right? Typically, it's uh, from some server or database running behind your corporate ID firewall, right? But with the cloud, you don't have to worry about managing all that hardware or software that's running on the back end. That's completely delivered by the cloud, right? So you are free to focus purely on your mobile app. And that's why I believe using a cloud back end for your mobile app leads to way, way, way faster time to market higher ROI, all the attendant benefits. I want to break that down a little bit further. Exactly, so you claim it's faster time to market. Exactly why is that faster time to market to use a cloud-based backend? Three basic points, zero infrastructure, scale, and application services that fast providers provide specifically. So let's quickly, very quickly go through each one. Zero infrastructure, right? This is your traditional enterprise mobile app architecture. It doesn't even have to be necessarily enterprise. Even consumer apps usually have some variation of this architecture, right? You have, of course, your mobile app, which is where you, you, know, you're, you write your Android application. But then typically, you need some piece of hardware and a whole stack to be managed on the back end or, or on the server side. And typically, that's all done in-house behind the ID firewall, right? You might need some sync servers. You might need some app servers, database servers, load balancers, whatever, firewalls. The list goes on and on and on. Right? Typically, that's the, that's the sort of the classic architecture if you were not using a cloud-based backend. The problem with that, of course, is you are stuck with having to maintain that entire infrastructure on the backend, right from procuring the servers to racking them to managing them, making sure they're always up time, uh, patching them, the whole, the whole you know, start to finish, you are responsible for doing all that, which takes away from time you can be, whoops, time that you could be spending on, on your Android app, right? Compared, you know, contrast that to a cloud-based backend, where it's really very simple. You have your Android device, or any mobile device, gets its data from the cloud, right? No servers to think about, because that's all managed by the cloud provider. You don't have to ever worry about servers or hardware, et cetera. No CapEx, which is kind of, you know, may not be as important to developers, but for the money guys in your company, that's really important is since you don't have to go buy servers and put up data centers, et cetera, there is no capital expenditure when you're using the cloud. It's all part of your operating expenses. It makes an actually big, big difference when you're doing budgeting, that kind of stuff. Manage hardware and software stack, I already talked about that. The past providers specifically not only give you virtualized hardware, but they give you much more than that. They, they manage the entire software stack, so you don't have, you have to worry about oh, how do I patch the, this, this Linux version that I'm running on my servers? That needs to be patched with the latest critical security uh, patch that got released. You don't have to worry about any of that. The cloud provider takes care of that. And then automatic upgrades. Uh, you know, for example, our platform is upgraded three times a year. Just every, every four months, we upgrade our platform. You don't have to do a single thing. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything. It just happens overnight. And al almost all other cloud providers do something similar as well. So you don't have to worry about upgrades. They just happen. Scale. So the second point about why is it quicker time to market when you use a cloud-based backend? It's very simple. The scale that a cloud backend gives you is literally unparalleled. It is literally almost impossible for you to try and recreate the scale that a cloud-based backend can give you. And this is just one example of our Force.com platform we did 54, over 54 billion transactions in the last quarter, billion. And that's just one number, right? Amazon has equally mind-boggling numbers of how many transactions, how many data they have up in their S3 storage. It's just mind-boggling. The scale is just mind-boggling. It is almost impossible. Maybe it's not impossible, but it, it takes a lot of money, effort, and time, and resources. If you were to try and recreate that scale on your own 
in your IT infrastructure, if you want to do this in-house, that is a whole lot of work, time, and energy that you're spending where you should really be focusing on your mobile app and your mobile uh, user experience, right? And, and the last thing, as a mobile developer, the last thing you want to worry about is, is will my backend scale? So let's say I'm really successful with my mobile app, and there are hundreds, if not hundreds of, maybe even millions of mobile devices connecting to my backend, running my app. The last thing you want to worry about is, will my backend scale to meet that demand? And so with the cloud, you don't ever have to worry about that. That just cloud handles the scale piece, up or down. It's pretty much elastic. It's pretty much infinitely elastic, really. So application services. Uh, again, you, know, you see this picture before. This is your classic three-tier architecture, as I call it, for classic you know, non-cloud-based backends, right? Now, the key point here is, as an Android developer, as, a, as any mobile developer, you obviously have to write your client logic. You have to build your app itself, obviously. But you also have to spend a fair amount of time, a significant amount of time in some cases, writing logic and code on the server side to expose data that your mobile app is going to call out to, right? Typically, this involves some sort of REST or JSON API or, God forbid, SOAP, if you really have to. Um, just kidding. Um, from, uh, you, you typically, that's an API call that you make from your mobile device to your backend to get data, right? And so in a classic architecture, you're, you're stuck with having to write code on the backend to expose that data securely, mind you, especially for enterprise apps. It has to be secure, it has to be scalable, it has to be reliable, right? That is not an easy undertaking. And as I said, as an Android developer, where, where do you think you want to be spending your time? I'm guessing on the front end, because that's your core competency. That's what makes your app unique and stand out in the marketplace, not the back end. Back end is just there to support, to maintain your data and support your mobile app. You want to be spending as much time as possible on the front end. And that's exactly what you get with a cloud-based backend, right? Because again, it's very simple. You have your client, your, your, your mobile device, and all, pretty much all the logic that you need for your app resides on that device, UI and app logic. And then you simply use APIs, connect to the cloud over HTTP and open protocols, get your data, update data, whatever you need to do. Simple, two-tier architecture. No, no server, no code to write on the server side. So specifically, if you were to use a Salesforce backend, which is, I'm going to you know, do a little bit of a deeper dive into the Porsche.com uh, platform that Salesforce has, this is what the architecture would look like, right? So just a brief introduction on Porsche.com and database.com. Um, how many here have heard of Salesforce? I mean, the company, our, our company, a couple. Um, have you mostly heard of us in the context of CRM? Yes, that's fairly common. What most, a lot of people don't know is Salesforce, obviously we are, we are a CRM company, we're actually the number one company in the world in CRM. But we also have a platform, a PaaS platform as a service offering called Force.com, right? So the CRM application that Salesforce is typically well, more, better known for sits on top of this platform. So you, one way to think about this is the world's number one SaaS application by far in terms of usage, users, transaction, by almost any metric you care to measure by, the CRM application, Salesforce CRM application is the, is the biggest SaaS application in the world. That is running on this platform. And so about, I don't know, five or six years ago, this has been a while, we actually opened up that platform to any of our customers or partners to build any app that they want. It can have nothing to do with CRM. In fact, most apps built on our platform have absolutely nothing to do with CRM. So you can pretty much build any enterprise business app that you have in your company on our force.com pass platform. And database.com is just the underlying database. So our platform, obviously the data that you have in our platform, in our cloud platform, has to have, uh, live in a database. And that's what database.com is. And you can actually pick one or the other. If you don't care about some of the application services that force.com provides, you can just go and buy database.com. And if you, all you want is store your data in the cloud, you can use database.com. So they're very close, they're related, but slightly different. So with, with, with the Salesforce architecture, you have your force.com or database.com backend, either one. And then you have an SDK that we've created specifically for Android. We also have an SDK for iOS, and we have an SDK for JavaScript, HTML5 development as well. But for today, I'm just going to talk about the Android mobile SDK, and I'm going to do a deeper dive into that. So on your Android, if you're writing an Android mobile app, uh, enterprise mobile app specifically, you would use the mo mobile SDK to connect to the, our cloud backend. And the SDK will take care of stuff like authentication and stuff that I'll cover in more detail. Well, speaking of which, more detail. Uh, so 
the Salesforce, the mobile SDK I mentioned for Android, basically does these following things. It's, first of all, it's all completely open source up on GitHub. So not only can you download the SDK itself, you can actually even, the binary, you can also download the code and tweak it if you, if you need to. So that's, that's great. And it supports 2.2 and above. I get asked this a lot, what versions do we support? So it's pretty much any Android device, really, in the, in the world today, which is great. And specifically, what it provides is an OAuth implementation. How many here know OAuth? Anybody familiar with OAuth? A couple, good. Um, so for, for the rest of the crowd, OAuth is, uh, I wouldn't say a newish, it is, it's not really that new anymore, but it's relatively newish security protocol. So as opposed to doing username, password authentication, which is what most, most mobile, at least consumer mobile apps do, OAuth is a more secure protocol, especially when it comes to mobile devices, because with OAuth, by the way, it's an industry standard, it's not a Salesforce, it's not our invention. It, we, we're just following a well-known industry standard, Facebook, Twitter, just about any company you can think of uh, 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 supports OAuth, including us. So basically, OAuth, as a mobile developer, why you should care is, bottom line, it's a more secure way of doing authentication compared to username and password, because it requires redirects. The application, the Android application itself, never gets to see the credentials that the user enters in to log in, and I'm gonna show you in a minute. So OAuth is a much more, uh, much more secure option uh, uh, than traditional username and password. And so the SDK includes an implementation of that, so as a developer, you don't have to worry about that. SDK takes care of that. REST APIs, all the data that you get from force.com is all REST-based, as I said, REST-JSON. The SDK provides very simple Java wrappers for you to access that API. And secure offline database. You can, you know, especially for enterprise app, that's a very common requirement is, okay, what if I'm offline? What if my guys are on the field and they're offline? Or if they're AT&T customers in San Francisco, which is really one of the same thing. Uh, so how does my enterprise app work? So the, the, uh, the SDK has a secure storage. Basically, we use SQL uh, Cypher under the covers to store your data for offline use. Okay, so um, I can see some people getting restless. Let's, enough um, enough uh, preamble. Let's, let's actually get, some, get our hands dirty with, with an actual app. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a very simple app that I built uh, using the Salesforce mobile SDK, right? Um, well, the lighting is not the best, but you, the, on the left is the screenshot of the app, which I'm just gonna show you in a minute. Uh, but before I do that, just let me just explain a very simple use case that I built, which is imagine that you're a field service agent, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you work for like GE appliances or something, right? And you're out in the field and you're going house to house fixing whatever, you know, somebody called in to say my, whatever, fridge isn't working. So let's say you're a field service agent and you need to access the, uh, what we call cases, right? Every time you call into a 1-800 number or go online to a website and, you know, log a case, uh, log an issue, that's basically stored in the industry, it's called a case, right? That's the name of the, uh, of the table, if you will, right? So this app, very simple app, all it does is lets field service agents on their Android app basically check all the cases that are assigned to them so they can look all the cases that are assigned to them while they're on the field, they can click into a case record, see some of the details, edit it, change the status, whatever, add a new case, things like that, very simple app, right? And of course, the data, the case data, right? All the data that's, that they're getting on that mobile app, that's to all stored on the force.com backend, right? So that's getting, basically using our REST APIs to get that data from the backend, all right? So let me just quickly do a demo of the, the app, and uh, since I can't, uh, demo from an actual uh, device. I'm uh, fortunately stuck with, the, uh, with everybody's favorite emulator, the Android emulator. Since I wanted my presentation to finish sometime today, I took the liberty of having it booted up. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, actually, the first thing you will notice when I kicked on that case management app, you notice how I, uh, let me just get rid of that. You notice how the first time, the first thing that it, that it did, the app did, was basically throw up an authentication screen, which is the standard Salesforce authentication screen. Which, by the way, you, there's a way to customize this, in case you're wondering. For your app, you can customize how this looks like. But this is, by default, this is what you get. And that's something in my app, when I wrote my app, I didn't have to do a, write a single line of code to implement this authentication part logic. That's all covered by the SDK as part of its OAuth implementation. And I'm gonna cover that in a little bit more detail. But just remember this, is the first time I launch my app, if I haven't launched it before, I will need to authenticate to salesforce.com. Salesforce so you need to have a, a valid user credential, basically. Um, let's see if I can demo. I believe that's what I did. Let's see. My very secure password, which I'm sure you guys didn't see. Login. Part of, this is part of OAuth. You actually have to authorize the application as well. I'm not 
going into too much into detail. Um, once you're logged in, very simple app. I'm definitely not going to win any prizes for creativity here. But basically what it's doing is showing you for that logged in user, what are the cases that are assigned to that user, right? So if I'm a field service agent, these are the cases I should be working on today. That's the case number you see on top. And then the thing in blue, that's basically the name of the account. So basically the name of the customer who filed that case, right? Very simple. Uh, so if I click on any one record, I should be taken to some of the details for that record. I can update it, I can create new ones, I can go back to the main list. Very simple, right? Classic list detail view, nothing, nothing fancy whatsoever. Let's go back and look at some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, plumbing for that app. But before I go to the Android part, I want to spend like a minute or two on actually on the backend on the force.com side, just to give you an idea if, as an Android developer, if you want to use a force.com backend, cloud backend for your, for your, uh, for your server side, how, what, the, what would that look like? What would you need to do? So remember, in my case, I'm storing my case data in force.com, right? That's where that, that list came from. This list came from, from my force.com um, database. So this is me logged into Salesforce. I already saved time. I've already logged in. I'm actually going to drop into the setup menu here. And this is if you're, in system ad, if you're a system admin in Salesforce, not every user gets to do this. If you're a system admin, that means you can get to, get to this admin view in effect, right? And you can do things like setting up your data model, setting up the users, et cetera, et cetera, things that admins typically do. Now, what I'm going to focus on is this thing called a schema builder. So the, again, as, as an Android developer, you want to use, let's say you want to use force.com or database.com as your backend to store data. What is the first thing you want to do? To your data model, right? Create your data model. What are the tables you need? What are the fields in the table? What are the columns in the tables? What are the relationships between them? So the way you do it in, in force.com is with this nice sort of declarative drag and drop tool, which I will need to, uh, with my resolution, I will need to shrink down. Um, let's see if I can find the case. That's the account. There, there it is, case. Uh, let me get rid of this guy. You can see that a little better. So that's a very simple tool, right? It's decorative. It's all point and click, drag and drop, which is nice. You know, no, D, no DDLs to mess with, no, uh, no scripts to mess with. It's all graphical. This is the case table, as I said. This is what I'm pulling from in my mobile app, right? And you can see it has a bunch of columns, like any table has, um, you know, account name, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it has these relationships. You can see all the you know, one-to-many, many-to-one relationships across your data model, that kind of stuff. Let me actually um, show you, if you were to create your own data model, I already obviously have this built up because my app is already working. But if you were to build uh, your own data model, you can simply, again, just do all drag and drop. So um, let's take an example. Let's say I wanted to add a uh, parts and labor. So let's say, in addition to tracking my cases, I want to track what are, what are the parts I use to fix the machine or whatever, right? And uh, how many hours I use that. Very simple. Let's create another table called parts and labor. Again, you'll see, notice it's all, uh, you have a plural labor, uh, parts and labors. I don't know if that makes sense, but whatever. Let's save that. And just like that, you have a new table in your database, in your cloud database, right? You have a new table. Not only that, you'll notice these audit fields slash system fields. You get those out of the, uh, I hope you can see them at least, yeah. Um, those are things you get out of the box with force.com, right? So the, the platform takes care of maintaining, not only creating those system fields like created by, who created this record, last modified by, timestamp, as well as the user ID, uh, who's the owner of this record. All these sort of system slash audit fields are created automatically for you every time you create a new table. Not only that, the data is maintained automatically by the platform. You don't have to do anything. Anytime somebody inserts a new record, the platform will automatically tag it with the data type stamp and the user ID. Same with modified by. So kind of nice not to have to worry about that versus traditional tables, you sometimes have to worry about that stuff, right? Um, and then you can f drop in all sorts of, these are all the different types of columns, basically, in a table. We call them fields. This is really the same thing. You can create all these different kinds of fields on that object, you know, checkbox, date, email. You'll notice some of these are sort of higher level type fields that you might be used from a traditional database, right? So not only are your traditional text and text area type of fields, but you'll also see some fields like phone or, uh, or, or currency, or even this very interesting thing called a, a formula field, which is you can actually embed Excel-like formulas directly at the database level on force.com, right? Which again goes to the whole productivity time to market question. It 
you can, of course, do this in any traditional database. Of course, you can have formulas and all sorts of triggers and that kind of stuff. But typically, that requires coding, and that requires time. In force.com, that's all point and click config driven, right? So, um, so all these fields that you can create, and then you can, of course, link up your, uh, your tables to, you know, paths and labors will probably be linked up to case, et cetera. You can also, by the way, create triggers on the table. So just like any database, you can create triggers and do validation rules and other stuff to maintain data quality. All that you can do in this database. But the one thing I want to actually point out that is really relevant to mobile developers specifically is every time that you create a new table in our backend, you automatically get, so as a, as, as a mobile developer, you're probably thinking, all right, so I have my table and I'll, let's say, assume I put some data into that table somehow. So how do I access that data from my mobile device, my Android device, right? Where's the, and where's the API? How do I get the API? And that's where really it comes up, where the sort of the, the application services, as I mentioned, that a platform as a service provide, uh, so provider like Porsche.com provides, this is what really distinguish uh, a pass offering from a pure IIS offering, is these little sort of additional application services. So this is one example where I just added that table right now in front of you guys, right? And I took the liberty of doing a, because I learned this the hard way today, is it takes forever to type this out. So I just copy pasted this already. The point being is as soon as you add a table in, in our database, you instantly have an authenticated REST endpoint for you to hit in order to get data from that table. Out of the box, you have, don't have to do anything. You don't have to configure anything. You don't have to write a single line of code. It's just there. The platform takes care of creating that REST endpoint for you to hit. So that's what I wanted to show you with that curl command. I'm not sure how readable that is. Maybe that's a little better. So simple call command. You will see the URI. This is basically the, the REST URI. I'm sure most of you are familiar with REST, right? So this is the REST URI that you would hit. So I'm giving examples of parts and labor, right? That new table that I just created. By the way, the underscore, underscore C, that's just our convention. Every time you create a table, we, we append the underscore, underscore C to the end. That's just, just so you know. So you literally, this is the URI you would use. You would give the instance of Salesforce, right? You can see this is my tab zero.salesforce.com, slash services, slash data. All our APIs have a version, and they're all backwards compatible, so you don't have to ever worry about backwards compatibility, slash S objects, and then slash whatever the table you want to access. In this case, I want to do parts and labor. And then remember, this is an authenticated, not only is it HTTPS, but it's also authenticated. Very critical for enterprise mobile apps. Not anybody can hit that REST URL. A valid Salesforce user has to be logged in in order to access that REST endpoint. And that's what you see this uh, OAuth header that I'm actually is missing from, uh, I have to scroll all the way, right? You'll see this big piece of OAuth access token that I've copy pasted in there. Without that, the REST endpoint wouldn't work. And if I hit my curl, I should get my JSON response coming back from, from force.com. Right now you're seeing, this is actually returning metadata about the table. It's actually not returning data. Because for one, I don't have any data. I just created that table. I haven't input any data in that table. But you can, in fact, also query, update, delete, insert, all the simple CRUD operations you can perform on your data, all via REST endpoints that are automatically created for you and ready, uh, available as soon as you create a table in Force.com. So that's really neat. That goes to the whole productivity, time to market uh, reason of why it's quicker to develop a mobile app using like a, a pass backend like, like Force.com. Okay, uh, let me just, uh, since my parts and labor doesn't seem to have any data, let me see if uh, my cases data might have. Let me show you, oops, this is all over the place. Uh, oh well, I wanted to show you some data from the cases table that my, uh, that my object is, that my Android app is pulling from, but you'll just have to take my word. I don't know what's, uh, I think the resolution is screwed up here. All right, so enough on the back end. Let's go back on, our, uh, on the Android side now. Let's look at the, uh, the, the Android app that I built and how I use the SDK to, to build that, the, the Salesforce mobile SDK, how I use that in my Android app. So if you're interested in using um, you know, the mobile SDK, our mobile SDK to develop a mobile app and have Porsche.com or database.com be your backend. Uh, first thing you need to do, obviously, it's all on GitHub, so you need to clone the repo and put it into your local machine, step number one, obviously. 
Next, you need to import the SDK into your own application, your Android application, right, in order to be able to use it. So there are actually two different ways you can do that. <clears throat> so this uh, Android SDK project that you see in Eclipse, that's me having obviously cloned, I already obviously have the SDK bits on my laptop, and I've already imported the Salesforce SDK project that comes with the SDK. I've already imported that into Eclipse. So you can see the whole source code for our SDK right here, right? So if you wanted ever, if you were really suffering from insomnia and you wanted to look at the source code, it's all there. Uh, but more importantly, how do I, so you know, the SDK is there, fine. I just want to use it in my project. How do I do that? Two ways. This is the template app. This is the case management app that I just demoed. This is this app. Uh, should have probably called it something more, <laughs> more intuitive. Sorry about that. But basically what I could have done is I could have gone in here and linked up the source. If I import the Salesforce SDK as a project in Eclipse, I can go in and basically link up as a library project. It's created as a library project. So Android developers, I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about. If I just go to Android, I can just create a reference to that SDK as a library project. I can just simply select Salesforce SDK, right? That's one way to do it. I haven't done it that way. What I've done is simply the SDK also ships in binary format. So in other words, we ship a simple jar file that you can just drop into your Android project, which is what I've done. So I've just dropped in this SDK into my libs directory, and that's how I'm using the SDK, right? So one of, either, one of, either one will work, whatever works for you. And then finally, you need to do some scaffolding. Once you've imported the SDK into your project, you need to do a little bit of scaffolding. Uh, let me just quickly show you, I won't cover everything that you need to do for uh, in the interest of time, but um, let me just see if this makes it a little better to see. Um, so the one thing you do need to do is implement a class which extends this base, uh, so it's an application class in Android. Obviously, application has special significance, right? So you need to implement an application class in your Android application that extends this base class that's included as part of our SDK called ForceApp, okay? And as part of that, there are a couple of things you need to override and return to the SDK, but really the, the biggest, the most important thing and the only one I will point out is this method called get main activity class. So if you remember when I launched my project, it, it, it showed me that login screen, right? I logged in and then I sh it showed me my actual app, right? So how did the SDK, that whole login process, the whole OAuth process was completely taken care of by the SDK. As an Android developer, I didn't have to write a single line of code to do that. But then how does the SDK know after it's done authenticating with Salesforce, what activity in your app do you want it to, to, to display, right? And that's what this does, is in, you can see that in my case, I'm just basically telling the SDK is once you're done successfully authenticating a user, just basically display the tab controller activity, right? And that's this activity that you're seeing. This is the two tabs, right? You're seeing the home tab and this other tab that I'll cover later on. So this is that main activity. That's how the SDK knows once it's done authenticating what class, what activity should display, right? That's as simple. There are a couple of other things you need to do as well. You need, for example, in your, uh, in your manifest file, you need to include a couple of permissions that the SDK needs. Um, let's see, a let, couple of ones. Uh, let's say, for example, manage accounts. You need that because under the covers, SDK uses the account manager of Android to manage the OAuth credentials. So you need to add a couple of permissions to your SDK, uh, uh, sorry, to your manifest file as well, right? So that's the scaffolding that I was talking about. Pretty straightforward, shouldn't take you more than like two or three minutes to do in order to start using the SDK. All right. So once you've done all that, let's go over some of the some basic functionality of, uh, of, of what the SDK provides, starting with the OAuth authentication. So this is really one of the most critical components of the SDK. Because again, remember, our platform is really tailored for enterprise apps, right? We're not, the Forge.com platform and Salesforce as a company is really meant for, to be used by enterprises more than consumer apps. And as I mentioned earlier, security is probably the number one requirement for any enterprise app, right? There are other PaaS platforms out there, obviously, but not all of them provide the enterprise level security that, that, uh, that our SDK provides. And the OAuth implementation is part of that. So what do you need to do in order to implement OAuth? You actually need, in your, in your Android app, you actually don't need to do much. You simply, let me scroll down here. You simply use this, uh, this class called login options, which is part of the SDK. This is kind of controls how you are going to log into forge.com, right? Couple of parameters. I'm not going to go over. I'm not going to go into going to the weeds there. Just two things you should remember, though, is you need to pass in something called a callback URL and something called a client ID. Now, if you know OAuth, you probably know what those are. But if you don't know OAuth, it's basically that's how OAuth works: is every app 
is assigned a unique, what's called a client ID, or also known as a consumer ID in the OAuth world. And that is something that Salesforce will assign to your app. So you just simply copy paste that value. In this case, you can see I'm basically uh, just, uh, as best practice, instead of hard coding it in my code, I've put it somewhere in my, uh, in my resources, somewhere, uh, I think it's somewhere here. Yeah, so this is my client ID. This is the long string that you have to copy paste that Salesforce assigns to your app, that's all. And then the other thing you need to do is a callback URL. That's something that you select yourself. That's not something Salesforce assigns. But those are the two critical things you need in order to use the, the OAuth piece of the, of the SDK, right? And after you do that, uh, let's get rid of that. You simply call this client manager class. You pass in that login options that I just showed you. And then you invoke the get rest client method of that class, all right? That's, that's the basic interface of using the Salesforce as mobile SDK. Client man create a new client manager and get the REST client, right? Now in order to the REST client, you, it actually uses an asynchronous design or, or a pattern rather. You actually have to pass in a callback instance or a callback uh, class into the get REST client call. And Salesforce, the SDK rather, will invoke this method, authenticated REST client method, asynchronously after the user is done authenticating with Salesforce, right? Under the covers, when you invoke this method, under the covers, the SDK is gonna go start off the OAuth, point the user to that login page, get the credentials, make sure they're logged in, blah, blah, blah. All that is abstracted out for you as a developer. You don't need to worry about that. SDK takes care of that. But it is asynchronous, and it's important, that's important because remember, I'm, I'm calling this from my main UI thread in my activity class, right? And as you know, in Android, you can't make blocking HTTP calls from the main UI thread. So that's why it needs to be asynchronous. And that's why this, you know, the SDK implements an asynchronous pattern where you, you, uh, you basically give us a callback and we'll, we're going to call that method once the authentication is done successfully, right? There is another way to do a synchronous. You can also get a synchronous REST client, but that is only meant to be used from like a broadcast receiver or something like that, anything that's not running on the main UI thread. If you're, if you're invoking this from the main UI thread, you need to do this. And so once you get back this REST client, this is the main class that you're gonna use from that point onwards. This is the class that you're gonna to use to make the REST API calls to get data or update data from Porsche.com, right? That is, this is the class that under the covers abstracts out all this, this REST URI endpoint that I showed you before, right? Uh, where is that? Somewhere, huh? Where is my endpoint? Gone, all right. Uh, that big endpoint HTTP URL, all that is completely abstracted away for you. You don't have to worry about what is the REST endpoint. The REST client will take care of that, right? So that's the basic uh, variable that you need to store in your class, which is what I'm doing here. From that point onwards, it's all authenticated. You can start making REST API calls. So the other thing about OAuth implementation is, uh, is the fact that it actually persists. There, it's something called, OAuth has something called a refresh token flow. Uh, if you're familiar with OAuth, you might know what that is. Bottom line, it's basically a remember me functionality. So after a while, OAuth basically gives you an access token, all right? Uh, part of the OAuth dance, as it's called, is getting an access token that then you can use to make REST API calls to Salesforce. At some point, that access token is going to expire. You can control the limit, you know, one hour, two hours, 10 hours, whatever. But at some point, that access token is going to expire. And so if the user tries to launch your app after that time period, he might, you would think that he would basically have to log in again, all over again. But the SDK takes care of that by implementing what's called the refresh token flow under the covers, which basically means it rehydrates the access token. Whenever that access token expires, under the covers, without you knowing it, the SDK rehydrates it from Salesforce and gets a new valid access token. Bottom line, as an Android developer, that's probably too much detail, but as an Android developer, all you need to know is once your user successfully logs in, and they can always launch back, launch the app back again. So let me go back uh, and uh, launch the app again. I will not be prompted to do the login again because the SDK under the covers is maintaining the valid access token and in making sure it's always rehydrated, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So it's that kind of remember me functionality, which by the way, you can disable if you don't want in your app. Okay, so that's authentication. Authorization, uh, OAuth dance. User authorization. Uh, so not only do you need to know, especially again for enterprise apps, enterprise mobile apps, this is critical. Not only do you need to know who the user is, not, not only do you need to authenticate the user, 
you also need to control what data they're allowed to see, right? So this app, again, is a classic example of that, is you have, let's say, service agent one, the, the mobile one user that I logged in as, is seeing a certain set of cases that are assigned to that user. But if a different field service agent logs into this app on their device, they should see, they should not be able to see this cases. They should only be able to see the cases that are assigned to them, right? So it's the classic, how do you control the data level access in your database question. And in Salesforce, that is all embedded in the API. You don't, as a developer, you don't have to write a single line of code, either on the Android side or on the server side, to control that. It's all done on the server side through configuration. We have a really complex and rich sharing model, which lets you control which rows of data down to the row level. So you can say service agent one sees these rows of cases or these records of cases, and this service agent use, sees these completely different set of uh, rows. You can even control it down to the field level or the column level. So in other words, you can say here on the cases, uh, this is my cases table, right? So I can actually say in, in, in the Forge.com backend that certain set of field service agents only get to see the, uh, I don't know, what's a good example? Maybe the escalated field, right? Only a certain set of users because it's critical for whatever reason. But I want these other set of users to be able to see that field. You can control it down to the column level as well as the row level. All in the back end, all completely configuration driven. I'm not gonna show you that, but just you know, take my word, it's not, you don't have to write a single line of code on the server side. It's all point and click and you can control the sharing model on a very, very fine grained level. And as a develop, an Android developer, it's great because you, the API respects that. Right? The REST API respects that user authorization and the data sharing. So here's an example. Let me log out of this app, which is my lame uh, icon for logout. Sorry about that. Let me log in as mobile2. That's another user I had in this org. And let's see what data that user sees. One, two, three. Let's quickly do that. Whoa. That's no good. This is another of the, I will actually need my, <laughs> I will actually need, it actually emails out a uh, security access token that I will now need to enter since I logged out, which I probably shouldn't have done, I guess. Um, sorry about that, guys. Won't take me more than a minute. There you go. Um, by the way, you can control this behavior. You can, if you don't, if you think this is an overkill for your app, you can get rid of this extra security layer as well. Three, nine, eight, five, seven. All right, that should do it. Log in. Allow that. And so now I'm seeing a different set of case data. And I didn't, in order to do this, again, as an Android developer, I didn't have to write a single line of code on either on the Android end or on the server side. Why? Because the REST API, the, the authorization model is embedded in the API. You just make the API call, and the platform will make sure you only get back the data that that particular user is authorized to see. Right? So that's the bottom line. OK. So that's authorization. REST API, we kind of have uh, been talking about this for a while. But so how do you exactly make a REST API call from your Android device to get or update data on the back end? So for that, you basically do, uh, what you do is, uh, let me show you an example of how I'm getting the case data in my Android app, is in this case, I'm, you know, one way to query data from the Forge.com back end is through something that's called Sockful, which is basically a subset of SQL. It's very SQL-like syntax. Uh, so it should look very familiar to you if you know SQL but it's, it's a subset of SQL. And I'm basically doing a SQL query, as we call it, to get a set of case data from the back end. So you can see I'm selecting a couple of key fields from my case record from the case table, right, where certain conditions are true. Namely, I'm looking for cases that are still open that have not been already closed, basically, right? And I'm ordering by certain order, limiting by five, right? So that's a SQL query. I'm, that's the data I want from my Forge.com back end. In order to do that, I simply call this, uh, this REST request object that's part of the SDK for which you can create uh, an object, right? There are different types of a REST API calls you can make to the force.com platform. You can query data, you can update data, insert, delete, all of those functions. Each of them have a different REST API call. 
Here you simply create the appropriate REST API call using this method, and then simply invoke the send async method. That's going to basically, under the cover, is going to make the REST API call to force.com, get back the data, and asynchronously, again, this is asynchronous, once the data comes back from force.com, it's going to call this on success callback method. And then it simply gets back uh, JSON. It's, it just gets back JSON data. And then it's up to you what you want to do with the JSON data. Right? So in my case, I get back a list of JSON array of cases, and I simply iterate through that and display the set of cases on the, on the screen. That's what you're seeing here. So that's how you make REST API calls. Is, is again, the SDK has some very simple wrapper classes. You can do querying, updating, deleting, inserting, whatever data manipulation you want to do using those simple wrapper classes. Secure offline storage, right? So I mentioned one of the key requirements for enterprise mobile apps is can I store my data on the local device securely so that it's available even if the user logs is, 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 is offline, right? And the key piece is secure, right? You can, of course, store data on Android. You, know, you can use SQLite, whatever, to store data. But it's typically not, not secure, right? So the SDK includes something called a smart sort function or a component, which basically uses SQL Cipher under the covers to store data on the locally on the device, but it's completely encrypted so that even if the user loses the device, nobody can get access or hack that data, right? So that's one of the key components of the SDK is this smart store component. Um, and let's see if I want to test my luck here. So uh, I'm not sure about the, actually, this should work fine. I was worried about the verification code. So you'll notice, obviously, I, you see the 3G icon, right? So obviously, my, my, uh, my emulator is online and connected to the internet, which is why it's able to get data from Salesforce. Now, what if I hit my F8, which is kind of a handy way in the Android emulator to sort of simulate offline behavior. So at this point, for all intents and purposes, this emulator is offline. No connectivity to the internet, which means it can't get data from Salesforce or any cloud backend, right? So let me go back out. But however, I've implemented offline in this app, which means that the last time I was online, that case record should have been stored locally on this device using my smart store function. And I should be able to access it. Fingers crossed. Let's go back to that app. Ooh. What do you know? It worked. So even though the, the emulator is completely offline, right, I'm able to get access to that data. I can still view all the details about that case record. Why? Because it's stored securely offline. Sorry, it's secured, stored securely on the mobile device itself using the SDK. All right. So real quickly, let me show you some of the code for how you would do that. Um, let's go up here all the way to here. So the smart store, I call, you know, smart store, as I mentioned, that's the sort of the name we've given to our offline storage component. Under the covers, as I said, it uses SQL Cypher. If, you, if you're familiar with that, it's basically an a encrypted version of SQLite, right? That's why it's secure. So under the covers, that's what the smart store uses. And as a developer, what you do is it, it exposes, a, but you actually don't need to know anything about SQLite. So actually, you don't, in order to store or get data from this offline database, you actually don't have to do, make any, uh, any uh, 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 SQLite calls. We, in fact, provide a, a very high-level abstraction over that, a very simple NoSQL-ish type interface, where you can basically give any random JSON to the smart store, and it's going to save it, and you can query it and update it and delete it. It's very simple name-value pair-based storage, right? Um, so that's what it does. Here, what I'm doing is the, the smart store has a concept of a soup. So any related piece of data that you want to store, it's kind of like a database table, but not really. But for the cases of today, you can think of that as a table. So what, I'm done, what I've done is I've registered a new soup, as I uh, always reminds me of that uh, Seinfeld episode about the soup Nazi. But um, you, what you basically do is you register a unique, you just give it a unique name. That's all you need to do. right? You register a new soup with the smart store SDK. And you can also set up some indexes So in order to speed up the querying of the data. You can actually even specify indexes. So this is actually how I've indexed. You basically have to give the path in your JSON data. How do you want the SDK? What is the path to the index field, right? And what type of field is it? That's what this thing is doing here, is I'm setting up an index on the ID field on my case record so that I can query it really quickly. All right. So that's pretty much it. You register the soup. And then once you get data, you know this, this piece of code gets invoked when I'm online. 
right? You can see this here is my get case data method actually makes that distinction. If it's online, it gets data from Salesforce. If it's not, it gets from the local DB, right? So I'm showing you the, the case where I'm actually getting data from Salesforce. And once I get data back from the server side, I basically just use this upsert soup entries method to actually store that data in the secure offline database. And then, so once it's there, what, how do I access it if I'm offline? Let me show you that method here, get data from, uh, from local database. You simply just, there's another method on, on, the, on, the, on the database or, or on the SDK uh, class called query soup. So you can simply query the soup, what is the name of the soup you want to query and pass in a query. Now there are different types of queries you can do. I'm not going to go into details. This is a very simple query where I'm basically saying, get me all cases that you have in your database. Simple. But you can do much more complicated queries, obviously. And that's where the whole indexing comes into play. If you index it properly, it'll be quicker. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, the SDK itself is read-only. So all we do is store the data in the SQL, SQL Cypher database. We do not take care of syncing that up to the back end when the device comes back online, which is a great question. So the sync and uh, hold that thought after the q and I want to address why we did it that way, but that's a great question. But, but the short answer is no, we do not do the syncing for you. You need to do that yourself. But that's a great question. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's how the offline works. You register soups, you add data to the soup, you query data from the soup when you're offline. Done. The great thing is, under the covers, it's all secure, encrypted. And you can see how easy it is versus trying to do this with SQLite or trying to encrypt your data and then storing it. Again, you can do it. I know people, maybe some of you have already done it in your mobile apps. It's all doable. It's just time, more time that you have to spend doing that versus working on your app. That's why using uh, use SDK makes a lot of sense. Finally, just some, some of the application services. I mentioned you know, plat fast platform provides some additional application services that are really useful for a mobile developer, unlike uh, infrastructure as a service provider. So one example I want to quickly give you, but especially relevant to mobile developers, is geolocation. So what I've done is, um, in my app here, is uh, probably need to be, again, offline for my app. And since this guy, oops, all right. Let me log in as the other user, because that user could see more cases than this one. Uh, mobile one, that's, oh, that's not it, uh, at demo.com, three, ah, the joys of using the Android emulator. Um, let's see, log in, allow, don't ask me for a verification code, please, oh, thank you. All right, so we're back to that initial user I was using. Now here's what I wanted to show you guys, is this other tab that I have, very simple, I know it's trivial, but it kind of makes the point, which is basically a very simple geolocation function where I've, uses, I've actually used the Google API add-on. If you're, if you're curious, in, in Android, you get the Google Maps uh, add-on. So I've used that to basically map out the current location, wherever the mobile device is. That's what this guy is showing here. And then I'm showing any nearby case records, right? So if this field service agent needs to make some house visits, right, what are the nearest cases within a 10-mile radius? I've done a query, and I'm displaying, uh, there should be a couple, oh, there it is. So I've, I've randomly geocoded my case, case data, and now you can see there, you know, these three icons are showing you the case number. That's the case number, right? So a very simple example of geolocation that may, mo a lot of mobile apps have these requirements. Now, you can, of course, do this many different ways in a mobile device, right? In your back end, you can do it many different ways. Here's how I have done it with Forge.com, is we have a special field called geolocation in, in, in Forge.com or database.com. You can, I don't know if you can really read this, but this, this guy here. And you've seen I've created a, a, a column called location on my case table. Uh, you know, no points for creativity there. But basically, I'm, all I've done is create a very simple field. It's a special type of, of column called geolocation. And that lets me geocode my data in my database with simple lat and long coordinates, right? That's all it does. That location custom uh, column, you can add lat and long coordinates for that case data, right? So let me quickly come out of this and show you that case data. Uh, so this is my, all the cases in my database. I'm going to just quickly show you 
This is, I'm, I've just randomly picked up some lat longs in San Francisco. Uh, this actually took me longer than I thought. I had to go through Google Maps, get the lat long. Anyway, you don't, you don't want to know all, any of that. Bottom line, it's, you have a special field type called geolocation in the database that you can use, and you can simply add your lat and longs to that data, thus geocoding it. That's nice, but you know, whatever. You could have created two separate columns called lat and long and done the same thing, right? What's the big deal? The big deal is on the server, on the client side, once you have geocoded your data on the database in Porsche.com, you can do the SOCWL. You remember how I mentioned SOCWL? That's how you query data. SOCWL has some special functions, geocoding functions, that lets you make queries like, give me all case data within a 10 mile radius of this lat and long, right? That's, that's, where, that's where it's important, right? And I'm going to show you quickly uh, nearby cases activity. That's the, that's the guy that gets invoked when I hit this tab, right? And in that, I wanted to show you, this is, the, this is the SQL query. This is that REST API call I'm making to the server side to get back the list of nearby cases within a 10 mile radius. And this is what you can do with, with, uh, with force.com. And you can, in your SQL query, you can say, you have these, we have these special functions called distance and geolocation. Uh, again, I won't go into the details. Ba bottom line, this query is basically saying, find me all case records which are within a 10 mile, and you can say mile or kilometers. You can specify the, the unit of measure. And you can say how much. You can say anything less than or equal to 10 miles of this given lat and long. I'm passing in my current lat and long. And it's going to return you all the case data back to you. Right? So that's one, one example of uh, application service that you, that's kind of built into the platform that you can use as a mobile developer. There are a couple of other uh, sort of productivity enhancement tools that, the, that a platform as a service cloud provider like Porsche.com provides. I'm not going to go into any detail, but you, know, you can model your data. You can have workflows in the back end. You can have analytics, which is really key, especially for enterprise apps. You can actually do lots, lots of reporting on the back end of your data for your users. Right? So that's great. You get that out of the box with force.com. OK, so kind of wrap up time. Um, hopefully, I've sort of tried my best to kind of make the case of why, as, an, as a mobile developer, specifically an Android developer, why you should care about a cloud-based backend, right? Why, why, why is it faster time to market, more ROI, all you get with a cloud-based cloud backend? And of course, I did a deep dive into force.com specifically, because that's my area of expertise. But by no means is that the only platform as a service offering out there. My, my point is you get some, most of these benefits, some of these benefits from a lot of the other cloud providers as well, force.com being one of them, right? But as a mobile developer, it behooves you to look at a cloud provider as your back end so that you can focus all your energy and time and effort on the front end, on your Android app, and making the best it can be, not having to worry about the back end. And so again, specifically, no, zero infrastructure, nothing to worry about. Cloud provider takes care of that. Scale, it scales up or down. Hundreds, millions, billions of transactions you can run against this backend. It'll scale elastically. And then these application services, some of the stuff that I just went through, things like the geolocation, the fact that you get a REST API out of the box, you don't have to write a single line of code, the offline storage, all that stuff that we just kind of went through, you get all of that, which hopefully makes you a more productive developer, lets you focus on your Android app. So quickly, next steps. If you're uh, if you're interested in, in in if you're interested in what you saw, you want to learn more about the force.com or database.com platform specifically. All free to join. All you need is a, a name, a email address, no credit card, not, none of that required. Just give in an email address. Go to this URL, developer.force.com/join. Give in an email address, and you will have a completely free environment to play with and experiment and test with. For forever, there's no limited, there's no trial period, there's nothing. It's just for, it's yours forever to keep. It's a sandbox test environment, really easy to join and start using. And a couple of links as well, if you, uh, for, uh, for you know, again, developer.force.com, of course. But there's also a, a pretty detailed article I wrote up about the mobile SD, the Android mobile SDK. So I, I kind of skipped over a lot of the details today because of uh, lack of time. But if you want more details about how to use that SDK in your Android project. There's a, there's a pretty detailed article up on Wiki as well that you can refer to. All right, so with that, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.